Hi there, I'm Jeremy Krug, and in this video we're going to take a look at the second part of Unit 9, Section 7, which is about galvanic cells and the calculations involved with those. Now, in our last video, we looked at galvanic cells, and we were able to determine that one of these electrodes is going to be the anode, that's where oxidation takes place, and the other electrode is going to be the cathode, which is where reduction takes place. The question I have for you right now, though, is how can you tell which of these two electrodes is going to be oxidized, the anode, and which one is going to be reduced, the cathode. Because in the last video, I just told you. Well, you might remember that there's this thing called the activity series. We learned about this way back in Unit 4 when we discussed redox reactions. And you might remember that the higher up a metal is on this activity series, the more easily oxidized that metal is. So in this example, we can compare silver and zinc, and we see that zinc is much higher on the activity series than silver is. So that tells us that zinc is going to be oxidized into zinc ions, and that means that the silver ions are going to have to be reduced into, into silver metal. Now, I guess we should mention that that activity series is not just some arbitrary listing that somebody invented. It actually comes from somewhere. And this comes from a list of what's called standard reduction potentials. And so every half reaction that we could ever possibly have has a voltage or a potential associated with it. Now I want you to notice that in the activity series that I showed you earlier, that was a list of what's more easily oxidized. Well, this list is the opposite. It's reduction potentials. And notice, in the last uh, example there, I had silver and zinc. Well, notice that the silver ions being reduced into silver metal has a much higher reduction potential than the other possibility, which I believe was zinc ions, being reduced into zinc metal. So since that's the case, the one that has the more positive uh, reduction potential, that's the one that actually is going to be the reduction that takes place. And the other one is actually going to end up being an oxidation. Now, we know that in every redox reaction, every galvanic cell, we're going to have one reduction and we're going to have one oxidation. Something has to be the cathode, something has to be the anode. However, every textbook, every listing that I've ever seen, always gives these half-reaction potential differences as reduction half-reactions. And they're always written as reduction. And so in order to account for that, when we calculate the overall potential difference of the cell, which we're going to call E-cell, we have to take the potential of the cathode that's given to us on the chart, and we're going to subtract the potential of the anode. And by doing that, we're going to be able to get the overall E cell. So let's take a look at this example. It says use these half reactions to determine which one is the anode, which one is the cathode, and the overall cell potential. So we're going to plug these numbers into the equation. Now, the thing is, we're going to plug them in in two different ways with the 0.34 in that first position, and then in the other possibility with the negative 0.44 in the first position. And we're looking for the answer that gives us a positive number. In every galvanic cell, the E cell has to be positive. And so which one of these subtractions is going to give us a positive number? That's what we have to ask ourselves. Well, as you can see, it's the first one. This one right here, is going to give us a positive voltage for that galvanic cell. So what that means is the cathode is always in the first position. So that means that the copper has to be the cathode because it was placed in that first position. And then the iron has to be placed in the second position. That's the anode. So that tells us that copper was the cathode, Iron was the anode, and that 
is something that we can tell because this subtraction gives us the positive voltage. Now, what is the overall cell potential? Well, it's whatever the answer to this is. So 0.34 volts plus 0.44 volts gets us 0.78 volts. So that's how we can determine which one's going to be the anode, which one's going to be the cathode, based on the half-reaction cell potentials. Now, we just calculated E cell, the overall potential difference, or the voltage, for this galvanic cell. I want you to notice that there is a little degree sign here. And as we've said many times in the past in this course already, that little degree sign mentions or implies that we are at standard conditions. Now, what does that mean? That means that our galvanic cell is operating at a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. All your solutions are at one mole per liter. If there are any gases present, they would be at one atmosphere. And later on, we'll talk about how that may not always be the case and how that changes your E cell. Let's try another example. We're going to use these two half reactions to determine which one is the anode, which one is the cathode, the overall cell potential, E cell, and the overall balanced equation for the process. So once again, we're going to plug into this subtraction and we're going to do it both ways. We're going to subtract this number minus that number and then we'll subtract this number minus that number. We have to see which one gets us the positive number. So which one gets us the positive value? Well, it looks like it's this one over here, isn't it? That one will work, that one will not. So that means whichever uh, value is in the first location, the first position, that's the cathode. So the negative 0.14, the 10, is the cathode. The one in the second position is the anode. So that would be the aluminum is the anode. So we've determined that. Now, the overall cell potential is just the numerical value of this calculation. So negative 0.14 volts plus 1.66 volts gets us positive 1.52 volts. The E cell for a galvanic cell has to be positive. If it's negative, you've done something wrong if it's a galvanic cell. Now, what's the overall balanced equation? Well, the way this works is you write the cathode's half reaction as it stands. So it's going to be 10 2 plus, plus 2 electrons, yields 10, just like it's written. The anode is the one you have to flip. And if you need help remembering that, just remember that anode is like anti. And so that means we have to flip the reaction. And that's also reflected in the equation because it's a negative. We have to subtract that number. So that's the one that we flip. So notice that it's written, you know, Al3 plus plus three electrons yields aluminum. Well, when we write the overall balanced equation, we have to reverse it so that we'll have the overall equation. So it looks like this. Now, when we add these two together, uh, notice that the electrons do not uh, cancel out as they stand. So we have to multiply equation number one by three, and equation number two has to be multiplied by two. So now we have six electrons that will fall out, they'll disappear when you add these together. And so now we have the overall balanced equation for this galvanic cell. So that's how you do an example like this. Let's try one that's a bit more uh, advanced. It says a galvanic cell is composed using nickel and an unknown metal at standard conditions. When the cell is first connected, its potential difference is read to be 2.12 volts. It is observed that the nickel electrode increases in mass as the reaction proceeds. And we have a half reaction here. Identify the anode and the cathode. Determine the identity of the unknown metal electrode. Write the overall balanced equation for the galvanic cell and predict the sign of delta G for this galvanic cell. Well, for part A, identify the anode and the cathode. There's a little nugget of information that the question gives us that we need to use in order to answer that. It says it is observed that the nickel electrode increases in mass as the reaction proceeds. That's the giveaway. Because remember, it's the cathode, the metal cathode, that is going to increase in mass. 
So that means that nickel has to be the cathode. Like we said in the last video, the cat gets fat, right? That's a little mnemonic aid that might help us to remember that. The cathode increases in mass. So that means the other metal, which we don't know what it is yet, that one has to be the anode. Now for part B, determine the identity of the, of the unknown metal electrode. Well, I'm going to plug into this equation right here. E cell equals E cathode minus E anode. Now we know two of these three numbers already. We know that the overall potential difference is 2.12 volts. That's what it tells us in the problem. So 2.12 goes in for E cell. We know that nickel is the cathode and it's uh, value is negative 0.25 volts. So that goes in there for E cathode and then we're solving for E anode. So we just have a simple algebra problem here and when we calculate this we find that the potential of the anode is negative 2.37 volts. So now all we have to do is take that negative 2.37 volts and match that up on the list of standard reduction potentials and see which element that is. And if you do that, we have that in the, on the previous uh, slide there, or you can look it up on your copy, if you've downloaded one from the, the uh, description below, and you'll find that it is magnesium. So we know that the anode is magnesium. Now the overall balanced equation, well, the cathode half reaction is written as it's given to us. So it's going to look like this. And so the magnesium is the anode, so it is being oxidized. So the magnesium is turning into magnesium two plus ions and two electrons. So now all we have to do is add these together. And it's kind of nice that these two electrons will disappear whenever we add them together. So our overall balanced equation looks like this. Nickel two plus aqueous plus magnesium solid yields nickel solid plus magnesium two plus aqueous. Now part D, predict the sign of delta G for this galvanic cell. Well, this is a galvanic cell. It's always going to be thermodynamically favored. All galvanic cells are thermodynamically favored. So the delta G has to be a negative value. It's less than zero. Let's take a look at one more advanced type of question that sometimes is given to us. Um, sometimes we are given a picture like this, which has several materials, and we're told build a galvanic cell that has the highest possible potential difference, the highest possible E cell. So what do you do? Well, we have to have the standard reduction potentials given to us in order to do that. So here they are. And can you use that information to figure out which one is going to have the highest E cell, which combination of these three metals? Well, we have to choose two. So what I do in my mind is I take these, these three values, these three numerical values, and, and I actually either physically or mentally plot them on a number line. So for example, the nickel half reaction has a half reaction potential of negative 0.23 volts. So that falls right around here on my number line. And the copper ion being reduced is positive 0.34 volts. So that's gonna fall over here. And then the aluminum is negative 1.66 volts. So that falls way back over here. And remember, we're trying to find the, the two metals here that are gonna create the greatest potential difference. Now literally what that means is we actually have to find the two metals here that have the greatest difference in their potentials. That's literally what that means. So which of these two metals would have the greatest difference between them? They're the farthest apart, aluminum and copper. So that's the combination you want to choose if you're looking for the greatest potential difference. Now, what if the question said, what's the smallest potential difference? Well, in that case, it would be nickel and copper, wouldn't it? But here we're looking for the greatest difference in those two potentials, the greatest potential difference. So now we have decided it's gonna be copper and aluminum. And so now we just have to calculate the cell potential. 
So we're going to plug into the equation E cell equals E cathode minus E anode. And if you look at these two values, you can see that the way this is going to give us a, a positive value for the E cell is to have copper in the cathode location and to have aluminum in the anode position. So when you calculate this, you'll find that 0.34 volts plus 1.66 volts gets us a total E cell of about 2.00 volts. So that's the potential of this galvanic cell. Now the last thing we have to do is to write the cell equation. So once again, the cathode, which is the copper, is going to stay as is. The anode, that's the anti, that's the one that you have to flip around. So we're gonna write this as aluminum yields aluminum three plus, plus three electrons. Whenever we add these together, we notice that the electrons do not disappear whenever you add these, these together. So equation number one has to be multiplied by three, like this. And equation number two has to be multiplied by two, like this. And now the six electrons will cancel out whenever we add these together and we get an overall balanced equation that looks like this. So we've had a few advanced examples here. I hope you've learned something from this video about galvanic cells and the calculations that we have to do sometimes involving those. If you learned something, please hit that like button. I hope to see you in the next video where we're going to move right on to unit nine, section eight. Hope to see you then.